So hello to everybody. So yeah, I am senior lecturer in the Agronomic University <coughs> of Paris. Uh, I have a double training in uh, agronomics and in uh, economics. And uh, I have a specialty uh, as a research field, which is uh, the agricultural policies, food and agricultural policies, and the analysis of of the of the agricultural markets and so on. So um, here I would like to present you uh, a case of policy, which is uh, the agricultural common policy, which is really a, a, a very important policy at the European level from the from the Europe. And I would like to show you that when we speak about the common agricultural policy, we speak also about the history of the European Union. And I'm going to try to make it now. And also to speak about um, you know, the challenges of this policy and especially the challenges of the agricultural sector here. Um, it will concern es especially the European area, but I'm going to try to make links with other areas. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for my very bad poor <laughs> English accent and uh, I try to change it but I think it's too late now <laughs> so <laughs> um, and I would like to ask to you uh, from where you go and I will I will try to make links with your area when I can so who is going from the American area nobody North America uh, from which country? Brazil. Brazil? Oh, yeah. Argentina. Argentina Brazil. And Brazil. So, at least I, I could speak a, a little about Brazil and uh, Bolsonaro and the new pol agricultural policies. And there is much to say about it. As I have a colleague which is, uh, who is uh, Sergio Leite. I don't know if you know him. He's a sociologist in Brazil, specialist. Uh, about the agricultural policies in Brazil, and he's really afraid now <laughs> about what happens in Brazil anyway. Um, then who comes from the ASEAN area? Yeah, so from which countries? Taiwan. Taiwan? India. India. Nepal. Nepal. Israel. Israel. Pakistan. And Pakistan, okay. So, um, yeah, I know I know the quite uh, a bit uh, the Indian area, other countries li less anyway. Uh, yeah, no, no problem. And other areas from European area? Also. So which countries? Italy? Italy. France. France. <laughs> Austria. 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 Sweden. 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 Belgium. And Belgium. Okay. Germany. Germany. Okay, great. Uh, Germany is wi my research area, especially, so <laughs> I know it. <laughs> um, and other countries, I forgot, from African area? No? Um, not this year. That's not this year. Not this year. That's all? I did not forget anyone? Okay. So, I see that there are many countries represented here, and uh, perhaps in the debate we will try to if you want to speak about also your area and what's going on also, when I know it. So now we are going to speak about the Europe and the, the challenges of the Euro agricultural policy in Europe. But you will see that I think uh, this is linked also to some stakes also which are, um, uh, it's concerned also your area as you, you will see. Um, so first of all, I would like to speak about the challenges of the common agricultural policies, the social, economic, and ecological challenges. What are the stakes of these policies? And I'm going to speak about the history of the common agricultural policy. And you will see that it's very linked to the history of the European Union. And then we could speak about the limits of this policy, which we could say is really in crisis. And uh, we are going also to speak about what we could do. Um, I should say that I'm very linked to, so 
I worked a lot for the public ministries and the European, uh, uh, with European Commission and so on, but I am also very linked to NGO, uh, environmental NGOs, um, some of the farmer trade unions. Hello. <laughs> Like Via Campesina, so that's not all the trade unions, uh, the farmer trade unions anyway. And uh, what I'm going to present is uh, also the positions we, we presented for a big uh, platform of uh, NGOs and Via Campesina and so on some years ago uh, for the last reform. So um, now about the commercial prices and income issues. Uh, you know that, I don't know if you know it, there is a positive and increasing agri-food trade balance for European Union, so we could say great for the European Union, uh, but some problems about it. Um, first of all, uh, there are very different situations in each country. For example, France exports more than it imports uh, agri-food products. But anyway, some of countries, like it, um, and in some products, some, some countries import more that, than they export. This is especially the case of the Uni United Kingdom, for example, which was specialized since, the la uh, since two centuries into the uh, into, uh, financial and service sector, and which, uh, um, which uh, so preferred to import at very low price, uh, some products from outside. So there are very different situations in European Union, and it will explain also very different position about the common agriculture policy. For example, the United Kingdom, uh, anyway, it, uh, with the Brexit, you know, and, and, the, and the fact that the United Kingdom is uh, coming out of the European Union, uh, it's now, uh, it's, less a debate now, but you know that the United Kingdom, for, for example, was uh, always uh, an opponent against the common agricultural policy that it was created, because uh, uh, it was for, for United Kingdom it was too, uh, uh, too strong, uh, it supported too much the agricultural sector and so on. Uh, contrary to the France, for example, which is a big uh, agri-food um, country of the European Union. Uh, moreover, uh, we should say that there is a very unbalanced trade balance now. Yes, this is a, a positive trade balance, but with big um, imbalances, especially sizable imports of fruits and oleaginous crops from South America, especially which uh, crop, you know? from Brazil, especially, and Argentina and United States. Soya. The soya, yeah. And we will see that this is because of a choice in the 60s, which was to, uh, uh, um, to move out any trade tariff in, Europa in European Union faced to uh, the United States. So we decided a compromise with the United States in the 60s, which is we don't have trade tariff uh, on the soya, and uh, since that, we have big imports of soya, and it's a very big problem because as you have ver uh, imports of soya at very low prices, and you, you will see we have uh, also, we had um, higher prices on cereals and so on, it favored uh, the development of one kind of uh, animal feed, feeding, Yes, which is a feeding with soya and mice, and not with um, grasslands, with grass. So it was it favored really much the, uh, this kind of uh, animal feeding, but it was a choice in the 60s to uh, make it less expensive for having a more rich, uh, richer um, animal feeding for uh, higher yields um, of milk, pro of, milk uh, of the cows and so on. So now we have very sizable imports, you know, of oleaginous crops for, um, especially. 
linked to an intensive livestock production in Europe based on maize and soya, as I said to you. Um, also, we have a very strong dependency to some countries for export exported, especially USA and China. And now there are problems, you know, for example, with China, not only in the agricultural sector, because you know that, uh, so some years ago we, we fought at the European Commission, not me, but the liberal guys and so on, they thought, okay, that's really fine, China uh, is uh, developing, uh, so has more la wealth, and um, people will uh, eat more milk products, for example, and especially more milk for very young, for babies. And we, we, so we, not we, but liberal guys, European Commission and so on said, okay, let's develop the milk sector. Let's have uh, very uh, high investments and so on. Anyway, you know that um, uh, the, the development of the, of the China is not like we, we thought. And uh, finally, the imports of China uh, decreased. And now we are in a situation where uh, there is not so, so much imports as we thought. And, uh, and so there are problems of uh, overproduction. And that's the same um, um, face to the Russian uh, trade. Uh, as you know, the Russia uh, decided an embargo face to the European Union, especially on some products, especially the agricultural products. And now there is a, a problem of export <laughs> towards uh, the Russia or the China. So with big problem of overproduction and uh, with decrease of prices in the European market. So that's the problem of uh, a model of development which is uh, very oriented towards uh, the exportations, the exports and uh, with uh, so um, fragilities um, according to ge the geopolitical situation and the economic situation of other big countries. Uh, anyway, of course, also, there are consequences of exchange rates. Uh, now I would like to speak about the agricultural incomes and the problem of uh, the agricultural situation in the countries. Uh, and the, agricultural sit uh, the economic situation of farmers. Um, I'm going to speak especially on, uh, on the French situation here, but anyway, we could speak about all the, uh, the situation of, of, uh, of other countries also. Uh, so in France, you know, we have still a, a familial farming or at least the, the big majority of, uh, of the farmers are familial um, enterprises. And, um, and the incomes are very, uh, are very variable now uh, because especially we will see uh, because of the deregulation of markets. Anyway, you, could, you can see here that the income is uh, really not increasing since um, for, uh, for 50 years, but there is really um, a change here, which is a very big volatility of prices. And this is really because of the deregulation of markets that we will see after. <coughs> and what is very uh, interesting to see is that there are much more than in other sectors economic sector, big inequalities between farms and production. That is, you have very big rich, you have very rich guys in farming, uh, guys or women, but you have also, also very poor um, farmers. And the, um, the part of poverty in agriculture is higher than in, uh, other, uh, in other economic sectors. But anyway, uh, the part of the very rich farmers is also very, very important. That's so, um, there are very big inequalities anyway. What is also Im interesting to see is that in France, but it's the same in all Europe, 
you have a huge increase of the volume of agricultural policies, uh, production, sorry, um, for uh, 50, during 50, uh, 50 years, with increase of yields and especially of work productivity, okay? So each farmer can produce more and more during uh, 60 years. This is the same in all, uh, all the world, okay? Uh, in average, anyway. But you, you saw that the income did not increase, or not so much, okay? Why? because there was a big decrease of the production value. And why? Because there was a huge decrease of the agricultural prices during 50 years, a very big decrease. I, I'm, I'm going to, to show that to you. So there is a decreasing added value because of the decreasing of agricultural prices. And the farm incomes could maintain themselves only because of very strong increase of gross productivity. So each farmer can produce more and more. And also because the there is more and more a huge dependency to direct subsidies. So the amount of direct subsidies uh, is growing very much during all these years. And now you can see that in France, but this is the same in very uh, in in the in the majority of countries in Europe. Almost all the agricultural income in France, okay, is um, uh, is represented by subsidies. So that's subsidies, the amount of subsidies, and the amount of the national agricultural income, this is quite the same, okay? So if, uh, if, there are, if there are no subsidies in France, only in Europe, there is no agricultural income anyway. And uh, for example, in France, this is 30,000 euros per farm. This is more than the minimum income in France, you know? So that's why we will see if this is efficient, if <coughs> we can explain why there are so many subsidies. Is it useful for the environmental challenges? Is it useful for the social challenges? Did it change something according to the social needs? Because uh, uh, the common agricultural policies, uh, this is uh, 50,000 of euros per year, uh, no, 50 billions of euros per year in Europe, 50 billions, and 10 billions in France, just in France. So my question is, is it useful? Do, are we, so is it, uh, could we explain why we have so many uh, subsidies and does it uh, serve the ecological and social needs. So here, this is only for il illustrating what I said to you about um, the evolution of agricultural works units. You know that the number of employments in agricultural sector decreased very, uh, uh, in a very uh, rap rapidly. rapidly very rapidly. So you, you can see that here, okay? Uh, this is for the friends. So more than uh, three uh, millions of farmers in, 60, in the 60s, and then we have less than uh, 1,000 of farmers now. And here you can see the development of the work productivity. So here's the development of the production and the development of the rock productivity. So with less and less farmers, we can produce more and more, thanks to a very uh, uh, um, um, a development, a very big development of the rock productivity. And why, uh, why does 
does it not allow um, uh, higher incomes in the farm sector because you, you, you can see that here the gross production is decreasing because of the decreasing of agricultural prices. Here you can see also that the intermediary consumptions <coughs> are maintaining themselves and so the added value uh, decreases. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was um, the volume of agricultural policies, uh, agricultural production. Sorry. Also, it's a price measure on the, on the last slide. So yeah, the volume of agricultural policy uh, production doubled. Yes. Okay, but as the prices decreased yeah, sure, sure. very rapidly, yeah. the gross production decreased yeah. because the prices decreased more rapidly than the agricultural production. Is that fine? And that's the problem. So now we can ask ourselves, perhaps this decrease of agricultural uh, prices is great, great because it allows anyone to buy uh, products, you know, at uh, lower prices. Okay, that could be great because it's a product uh, uh, of first necessity and, uh, you know. And here you can see since uh, 70s, uh, the, the level, so the, the, the development of the agricultural prices here, you, you can see that it's decreasing very rapidly. But here you can see the food prices. So we can see that it doesn't allow lower prices for consumers. So now there is a big debate about that, especially in France. I don't know if you heard yesterday the, the, there was an announcement of higher prices of food products in France. There is a big debate about that because agriculture farmers say only way we have lower and lower prices but the food prices are not decreasing. You can see that here. On your mind, um, what do they say in uh, uh, the industrial sector and in the um, big distribution? I don't know if we say the big distribution, yeah. Uh, big retail, no? Comment, comment tu dis, Danny? I, I don't know. Yeah. A big supermarket, so anyway. So what the, what's the boss of the big supermarkets, like uh, Leclerc uh, yesterday in the news or... Uh, or uh, the, the big industry, uh, the big food industry say about that? What is the reason according to them? More costs? More? Costs? Yeah, they, they say that. We have more costs because there is much more quality of the products. Uh, you know, we have more processing of the product. Okay? You eat less and less uh, uh, non-processed products and you eat more and more processed products uh, with very uh, much with more quality, okay? That is the reason expressed by uh, charles Edouard Leclerc and uh, the big boss of the supermarkets. And what do say the farmers' unions? And many economists, anyway. Yeah. Yes, it's like the widening of margins from the same market. Yeah. Sure. And <coughs> we have also today a public observatory of that. And what does it show? That in fact, the margins of the distrib of the processing uh, industry and of the supermarkets, these margins are increasing. 
and uh, because of uh, uh, a power balance much more in favor of the food industry and especially in favor of the supermarkets. And you can see that we have, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of farmers which are very weakly organized face to, I don't know, four or five big uh, supermarkets now. I, I can I can say that there are, uh, and this is the same in very many countries in Europe. We have Leclerc, Carrefour, Casino, Sup Super U and Auchan have the same one now, uh, the same uh, Central d'achat, I don't know how to say that. And well, yeah? I don't know the, don't know the word. That's yeah. The point. That's how they really so, yeah. And so we have a concentration at the level of the food industry and the big supermarkets face to hundreds of thousands of farmers which are really weakly organized unless there are big cooperatives. But anyway, in France, the cooperatives are, are not so uh, are not so strong anyway, and they make also failures, <laughs> but we, I'm not going to speak about that today. So anyway, we have this problem. Yeah. I just wonder about this graph actually, because you say this is the price of uh, agricultural products, the green line, and since 1970, indexed and 1973 yet. But this is like um, after inflation, or how is this? Uh, this is, uh, include, uh, it includes inflation, anyway. Yeah, it includes it. So even though we have inflation, the price decreased by half for agricultural products, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, I also uh, always include the inflation. Okay. And we, if we don't do that, we don't see any <laughs> anything. <laughs> So now I'm going to speak about the employment and farm structures. And I'm going to speak about France, but also about other European countries. Uh, you know that just after the Second World War, we had a third of the population in the agricultural sector, now 3%. And many less in some countries. For example, in Germany, this is 2%. And United Kingdom, 1%. And um, we will see, on the contrary, that in Eastern countries or in South countries like Italy, the part is higher. In Italy, I think this is 5 or 10%. Uh, which countries? Austria, 1 or 2 also. This is not a big farm country. Um, anyway, of course, in uh, South countries and uh, in India especially, and. Uh, the majority of the population is still in the, in the agricultural sector. You know that uh, um, quite, not the half, but a third of the population of the world lives uh, thanks to the agricultural sector anyway. So, but in all countries in the, in the north part, uh, the part is very, is very low in Europe. But be careful, for example, in Romania, a third of the population lives thanks to the agricultural sector. In Poland, perhaps 15 or 20 percent. And the fact is that in Romania, for example, you, you, or in Poland, or in Bulgaria, there are very, very little farms which are subsident, uh, subsistent farms. So they don't sell to markets or just a little part of the production. They are very little uh, farms, but anyway, they are the farms which are the most fragile farms. And the problem is that if we implement this model of 3% of working people in the agricultural sector, what do we do with all these people living thanks to the agriculture, uh, the agriculture in this kind of country like Romania or Poland and so on? What can they do? Because we have now a very uh, quite high rate of unemployment and uh, there are not uh, many jobs as we had in France when we implemented this kind of model in uh, the 60s or, or 70s. Um, 
so you know this decreasing of job, uh, this uh, decreasing of job in the agriculture is uh, continuing now, uh, and this is almost as many employments destroyed in agriculture than in the industry uh, during uh, during f 30 years. But it's more silent anyway. It's more silent because. Uh, it's a farmer which not uh, transmits uh, its farm, which stops its activity, and the farm is um, uh, is uh, sold to uh, another farm, you know, and there is a process of concentration of farms, more and more, and uh, and, uh, and a big decreasing of the number of farmers. So. I said that uh, the majority of farms is ma uh, familial farm, and we can see here that anyway there are less and less family labor forces and more and more salaries, which more precarious employments. For example, in the agricultural sector, there are many posted <coughs> workers. And finally, <coughs> we could say that in France, like in many countries, there is. Um, there is less and less familial model of the agriculture. Uh, of the agriculture. Uh, in some countries, this is uh, really this is uh, now a capitalist model. Really, really. F for example, I, I spoke about the Romania. I could speak about many Eastern countries. You have many little farms, but also the majority of the agriculture area is occupied by capitalist farms. Anyway. Only uh, uh, few farms, only few capitalist farms, which occupy the majority of the agricultural area, like it is the case, for example, in uh, in uh, the Czech um, Republic, for example, or in some other countries. So ra in France, a rapid disappearing of farms, like in all uh, the Europe, which a concentration of land and capital in ever larger farms. Uh, for example, half of farms disappear in the last 20 years, and especially little farms, which are the ones which employ more people, and especially the farm with livestock and polycropping production. Uh, we will see that this is a very big problem concerning the ecological issue, to have a disappearing of this kind of farms, which combine livestock and, pro and cropping. And so I said, what about all farmers in South and East European countries, and especially subsistent and semi-subsistent farms in the context of mass employment? Finally, uh, also, we could uh, observe uh, a higher in-depthness of farms because they are higher and uh, they are bigger and bigger, you know? They invest more and more, and so they are indebted more and more. And the problem is that as it is, um, as these farms are bigger and bigger, finally this is more difficult to transmit it in a familial, uh, in a familial way. Okay? Uh, this is the share of the agricultural employment in Europe, so you can see that there are big differences. Sweden, for example, is here, 1% of the population in the agriculture. Uh, on the contrary of Romania, almost 30%. So very big differences in Europe. Also, according uh, also this is the average size of the farm in Europe. You can see that in all the north-west uh, uh, parts, you have big farm in average. But here you have very uh, more little farms, especially Romania. A part of the south of Poland, Greece also. Um, so big differences, which is a problem in the European Union, which is bigger and bigger with many different countries with different agricultures, and it explains also why we could, we can, we cannot manage, we don't manage to have a common agricultural policy today, because we created a common agricultural policy between six 
mem uh, states. And now we have to imagine a big agricultural policy with almost 30 countries. Finally, environmental and health challenges. Uh, it won't be very optimistic anyway. <laughs> uh, you know that agriculture I is, uh, is first of all a, a climate issue. Around 10% of Europe's greenhouse gas emission come from the agriculture, especially some uh, gas like methane, nitrous oxide emissions. There is an increased use of fossil energy uh, and a responsibility especially of one kind of farm of farming, which is what I call the intensive farm production. Uh, this intensive farm production, um, uh, this is a production with more and more machines, with more and more yields, uh, but because of more and more inputs of pesticides, fertilizers, okay, herbicides. Um, this is also farms which are bigger and bigger and which uh, move out any kind of uh, hedges, trees, and so on, because uh, it prevents the machines to uh, make the job, you know. So we destroy hedges, trees, uh, we have uh, bigger and bigger... Um, ah, parcel, when, how we say that? Uh, I know that... Uh, uh, yeah, it's here. Um, larger plots, yeah. Larger cultivated plots, less hedges, trees, less crop rotations, that's it, you, you know, um, uh, traditionally, you have a, ve a very big diversity of rotations in one, in one plot. Why? Because you can avoid um, any dis uh, diseases and so on, okay? Now we are um, simplifying these rotations with two... Uh, the extreme is one, uh, one uh, plant, for example, the maïs. The maïs, since s uh, for uh, 30 years, in one plot, okay? And it explains why you, we have more and more problems of diseases in the, uh, in the agriculture. So less crop rotation, specialization of farms and ranges, for example, uh, especially livestock in the northwest of France and big crops, uh, crops in the, you know, around Paris and uh, in the northeast. And this is a problem because you need organic matter and you need livestock for fertilizing naturally, if you, if you want, uh, the, the crops. So if you don't have livestock in one region, you have to use what? If you don't have organic matter, what do you use for fertilizing? The soil. Ferti chemical fertilizers, yes. <coughs> and, um, and so that's why, also it explains why we need more and more fertilizers. We also observe in France and all, Euro all over Europe a decreasing of grassland area. And all of this is a problem concerning biodiversity. We really observe now, all the authority now observe a very big decrease of biodiversity in the agricultural areas, a very big decrease. Also a, a decreasing of the soil quality, of the water quality, for example, in France and in many countries like Netherlands, like Germany and also Ireland and so on, we have big difficulties, for example, to respect the European Nitrates Directive because we have too much uh, azote, azote, azote um, which is used uh, on, uh, because of uh, too much uh, livestock in some regions. So uh, we could say that uh, there is no improvement. On the contrary, for example, for the herbicides, we know that we observe uh, an increase of the amount of herbicides in France since 10 years, uh, for 10 years. This is very clear. 
Finally, nutritional and health problems also uh, linked to the food model. Even more... Wait, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to say that I read a, a study recently saying that actually 90% of the population is not eating enough and was reliant on um, artificial uh, phosphorus, uh, like phosphorus fertilizers, around around 90%, if I remember well. So, I mean to phosphorize? Yes. It depends, uh, it depends on the region, anyway. In some regions, you have very um, big problems of phosphor, 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 phosphorus. phosphorus. And uh, in some other countries this or regions, this is because of the nitrates. Uh, it depends of, uh, of the regions, anyway. In Germany, for example, this is especially a problem of phosphorus. In the uh, Netherlands also. In Britannia, this is a problem of nitrate, uh, first of all. And more and more of phosphorus. <laughs> Um, so even more consumption of processed prod food products with large quantity of sugar and fat, uh, which uh, means increasing problems of obesity, massive use of pesticides, stronger, uh, so uh, uh, there, there are stronger concerns on quality and safety food. It's clear that we can see also, we can observe that's clear, and to be uh, quite a little optimistic, a diversification of activities on farm, uh, the development of short supply, supply chains, quality signs, especially organic farming. But be careful, this is only 6% uh, of the agricultural area in Europe. So this is not the revolution, anyway. And so it remains still marginal. I was re really too long. <laughs> All of this, I mean, are the challenges of the CAP, of the Common Agricultural Policy. In s 10 minutes, I'm going to try to explain why the Common Agricultural Policy is really not an answer to all of that. So, but for that, I really need to make a short presentation of um, the origins of this policy. You know that this policy uh, was created when the European committee, uh, community was created. And it was linked to a, the creation of the common market of industrial and agricultural products. And especially France accepted that because, or thanks to uh, a compromise with the Germany and the creation of the agricultural policy. And this common agricultural policy uh, had one objective, it was to um, make the Europe more uh, sufficient, more uh, uh, in food products, to make, uh, to have food security. Because, you know, just after the Second World War, uh, the Europe was destroyed uh, and the, the we, we had to import uh, much products in Europe. So, many products in Europe. So, and we, we were also in, a, for this period, or in a period influenced by uh, the Keynesian policies <coughs> and, and so on. That's why for, any, for uh, the six countries, it was obvious to have a very big regulation of agricultural markets. The idea was we cannot let the market fix the prices and, uh, and uh, the trade of agricultural products. Or it won't, uh, it won't be a success. So uh, we uh, fixed very strong um, objectives, increasing the productivity of agriculture. And you can see that it was a success anyway. You, you can see that thanks to what I, I showed to you. We had also the objective to ensure fair life conditions for farm population and reasonable prices for consumers. Anyway, uh, with this big objective of food security. And for that, we said we need to regulate prices. Especially for strategic production, which why, where, uh, which were the, the big production of the six member states which funded the uh, European community. Crops, sugar, coal, milk and milk products. 
And what we say, what we made, we fixed guaranteed prices. So theoretical prices, if you want to. And we said that the European prices, uh, the European prices did not have to be lower than these guaranteed prices. So the prices paid to the producers, to the farmers, had not to be lower than the, the guaranteed prices. This was a way of maintaining the prices. Okay? And so that's why when the Europe uh, why did we do that? When the European price um, was at this level, okay, what did we do? On your mind? And this is still the case in some countries like China, like like India. India ma make makes it now. What we do when we have a decrease of prices? We buy the products, yeah. Storage, food storage. We, we make public storage, and so it allows the price to increase again. And what we do with the storage? When we have, because the problem is that uh, it was a very big success, but the storage were bigger and bigger, so what did we do with the storage? We? We? Destroy them? We can destroy them. We did that a little, but it, don't I it isn't sufficient. Export? Yeah, Ex exactly. We export it at the international price, which is lower. So we pay the exporters, okay? Uh, to in order to to uh, in order to compensate the different the difference with the, the international price, we name it export subsidies. And finally, also the problem is that we have higher prices than in the world market, so we must be protected. That's why we had also duties varying according to the world prices. If the world prices were very low, we had very big uh, duties. And on the contrary, we could have also uh, um, no more duties if the uh, international price is, uh, is high. So you know, it was a very, uh, a very big uh, regulation of the markets and it allowed increasing investment, labor and land increased productivity, increasing production um, and it uh, allowed also thanks to this uh, productivity uh, to bring workers in the rest of the economy and uh, also it allowed uh, the decreasing of food prices because this, uh, these guaranteed prices we are decreased, but very progressively, okay? However, since the end of 17, there is an increased agricultural production in other parts of the world and stagnation of world demand and exchanges. So, um, uh, so there is an apparition of surpluses. And uh, the problem is that the export subsidies were very expen expensive for the Europe so that it created budgetary tensions and especially also um, it was no more accepted by the United Kingdom which entered into the European Union in the 17th with a very liberal view and uh, also um, a hostility from USA and other export countries which did not accept anymore the, uh, the common agricultural policy because it was too much a success for the Europe. Because thanks to the common agricultural policy, we exported more and more food products and it was a danger for USA especially. And for other countries like Argentina, uh, Canada, and Australia and so on, which made um, a coalition in the GATT, so you know, the, the commercial uh, 
international commercial negotiations, they made uh, a coalition to, uh, to make enter the agriculture into the negotiations, the trade negotiations in the GATT. You know, the GATT uh, is uh, uh, the former WTO. Yeah, you, you, they know that, I think, yeah. Okay. And so that's why uh, the WTO agreement included the agriculture uh, in uh, uh, 94 and uh, it demanded to all which country, especially the European Union, to abort all regulation market, or not to abort all regulation market, but a part of it. And you know that the European Union was more and more liberal, so that we answer to the WTO demands more than any other country. We, we, uh, we became the, uh, the best uh, student or the best uh, member of the WTO <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and uh, we made exactly what was demanded regarding the agricultural sector. And what was in it? It was to deregulate markets and to um, 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 to make uh, to to have a convergence between international and European prices. You can see here we um, make disappear or almost disappear the guaranteed prices here. Okay, we decreased it and it have it has no more impact. It has no more efficiency. And so now, now you have exactly, uh, you have a convergence between international and European prices. That's why the prices are more and more volatile. And the problem is that before the European Union had a role of stab with the stabilization of mar uh, world markets. And you, you can, I don't know if you understand, but as we deregulated our markets and our prices, we, we, we also uh, um, brought volatility to the agricultural world markets. And um, wha what did we do finally? We decided to compensate it with direct payments in, fr in uh, Europe, direct payments given to farmers. That's why now direct payments are, are so huge in Europe. Okay. And I, I'm going to finish with that. So these subsidies, are they good now for the, uh, as regards the economic, ecological and social issues? That's why we are going to see here. There are direct subsidies per hectare or per co. Uh, they uh, transform more and more in what we call decoupled payment. What's it? What is it? It's uh, they are payments given to farmers according to each hectare. So if you produce one or one product, or if you produce w s uh, one or one volume, okay, this is not the matter. You have 50 hectares of agriculture <coughs> area, you receive 50 rights of payment. Okay? And the problem is what? On your mind. If we pay per hectare the subsidies. What? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's it's totally linked to uh, the size of the farm and this is not uh, according to the amount of jobs for example or uh, the fact that you respect nature and um, or the fact that you, you create wealth and added value because some of the farms don't create any added value Th they only have Subsidies, okay, and uh, and so that's also a problem according to the, the economic issues. Um, finally, I have also to add that um, 
in this history, there was another kind to regulate, to answer to the problem of overproduction. It was called the, quota, the quotas. In the, in the 80s, we implemented, um, uh, we, we, we obliged each, each member state and each farmer uh, to uh, produce no more than one fixed amount. And these quotas allowed to decrease a little our production of milk products. And we made the same for sugar products. And in the crop production, we also obliged each farm to have one part of the crop area without production. So it was an attempt to answer to the overproduction without deregulating markets. You, you understand? And that kind of regulation, for example, in the milk sector, it allowed really to decrease the production and to answer to the overproduction. And so it allowed uh, to answer to the budgetary problem. And also it allowed to not to destabilize international markets. So it was great. But as we deregulated markets in the 19th and, uh, and in, the, in the 20 last years, we decided also to move out all quotas and so on, because the liberal view of the European Commission um, considered that any measure uh, constraining the volume of production was too much intervention of the markets. And what, the consequence, what, is the what are the consequences, for example, in the milk sector, now you have an overproduction since three years. There is a, a <coughs> bigger volatility of international and European markets because of that. And, uh, and, big, uh, and so big also economic and social problems in the milk sector. Um, Finally, I, I would say, I, could, I have to say that the European Union tried anyway to take into account a little environmental issues. That's clear. With agro-environmental measures, for example, which subsidize farmers which try to have environmental practices like organic farmi farming. Okay? Uh, we tried also to implement cross compliance. This is environmental condition if you want to receive all the subsidies. But anyway, the budget, uh, the, the budget for these measures uh, stayed very low. Okay? And these conditions were really low also. It did not change quite anything. Why? Because there is a liberal view of the cap of the common agricultural policy now, but there is also a productivist lobbying, very strong productivist lobbying. In, ex in France, this is called the FNSEA. This is uh, the trade union compound of the bigger farms, which uh, continue to consider that we have to produce more and more in France. We have to uh, uh, increase uh, the yield and uh, uh, that the environmental issues are only matters. And uh, that's why, uh, anyway, there is a combination between liberal views and productivist views in, uh, uh, in the compromise in the common agricultural policy today. This is a common agricultural policy which don't regulate any more markets and prices but also which don't take into account the environmental issues. And um, also, f last point, and, and I'm going to let you discuss all of that, and if I can, uh, I will finish the last part in the discussion anyway. Um, finally, 
I have also to, um, uh, to underline that the cap is less and less a common agricultural policy. This is more and more a national policy. Because with 27 countries, or 28, it depends on the United Kingdom, um, it's really uh, more and more difficult to have common view of the common agricultural policy. And for example, if you want to decide one measure, you need to have uh, more than the majority of countries, you know. This is a qualified majority in, in, in the European Union. So you, you need perhaps 60% of the countries and of the population, representing more than uh, the half of the population. And for having these uh, decisions, for example, for quotas, it's very difficult. And what we can consider he here is that with 28 countries, on my mind, we are not able anymore, with so many views, to implement a common agricultural policy which is very efficient. Contrary to uh, the United States, for example, contrary to some other countries which are able to make it, or contrary to the China, which has, have, uh, China has now a, a much more strong agricultural policy regulating markets than uh, the European Union. This is the same for the United States. And in the European Union, we are totally embedded uh, in our dissensus, on in our liberal view, which, which prevents any efficient agricultural policy. Because in the history, most of the time, in most of the big countries, there were regulation of markets. Because food, and I, I'm going to finish with that, food and agricultural products were quite never uh, abandoned or led to the markets. Because this is a strategic question with so many challenges, and I tried to show you. And on my mind, this is really a disaster that this policy is now, um, uh, is now uh, non-efficient uh, because of uh, the development of the European <coughs> Union. And anyway, the common agricultural policy, which was really um, uh, a pillar, a pillar of, uh, of the European Community Union, this pillar is really not uh, anymore a pillar. And it is now rejected by so many uh, uh, citizens, uh, organizations, uh, politicians, and so on, and citizens don't see anymore why we need that, because it don't answer to the challenges. That's it. So sorry to have been uh, so um, uh, <laughs> negative <laughs> about all of this. Uh, I'm letting you uh, you the discussion. <laughs>
And also, as uh, our guest lecturer already mentioned, uh, the employment in the agricultural sector fell uh, by 25% only over the last decade. Um, but at the same time, uh, farmers are very important because they help to uh, develop the rural environment. And therefore, the CUP offers trainings and financial assistance, especially to young farmers. Another uh, thing that is very important for the CUP uh, is the commitment to the protection of the environment. Uh, if it's efficient or not, that's uh, left aside. Uh, but, for example, farmers get uh, more support if they use fewer chemicals, if they produce organic, or if they leave some boundaries uncultivated, if they maintain ponds, trees, and uh, if they protect wildlife. At the same time, the CUP tries to promote food uh, quality and diversity, so it tries to um, protect 750 local foods um, and especially organic farming is fostered. So abolishing the cup would clearly put this variety under a threat and uh, it would replace them probably with cheaper foods from uh, abroad. Then as we already saw there is also a lot of critique about the cup. As we've heard before, um, the main critique goes uh, to the budget because a small uh, proportion of the EU population gets a very high amount of the EU budget. So about 3% of the population is farmers in the EU. They produce around 6% of the GDP, but they receive 30% of the EU uh, budget. But uh, in my opinion, what's often left aside is the positive externalities that the farmers produce. So, for example, food security in uh, Europe. Um, then another big critique uh, that we've also already heard before is uh, that the cup helps mainly big farmers. So about 80% of the aid goes to 20% of the farmers. And uh, especially food giants like Nestle or Campina get hundreds of millions. And one interesting fact uh, about the Queen, that also she gets like, around half a million of euros uh, in subsidies, because she owns a lot of land. Uh, so yeah, this uh, leads to the concentration of the global market. And uh, as we've heard before as well, this is especially due to the single farm payment, which is not a basic payment scheme. So basically the money that goes directly to the farmers according to the hectares or to the land that they own, leaving aside the productivity or environmental damage that they make. So yeah, um, on this graph we see that since 2000, 2003, uh, this green area, this is all uh, direct payments, so it's the biggest share of the uh, budget that goes into the um, into the cup. Yeah, um, so competition can be harmful in terms of diversity protection and food security, but too little competition can also lead to higher food prices and uh, the excessive use of tax money, that's also often a critique that is made on the cup. Um, yeah, inefficien inefficiency in improving the environment, uh, impact and biodiversity. And finally, the last critique that I want to mention, which we also already heard before, is the overproduction, which um, yeah, is either destroyed or exported to developing countries f at a very low price, and that can have detrimental effects on developing countries. But my colleague Anne will now tell us more about the effects of the cup on developing countries. Yeah. So we've been talking mainly about the effect of cup in in uh, Europe. So here I would like to do a little bit complementary to talk about cup's effect in developing country, since EU is a very big trade partner with developing countries. So cup has long been criticized for its negative effects on food security in developing countries. This is associated with what we were talking about the EU export refunds and dumping. So this makes has distorted uh, competitions and make agriculture prices lower, and this is exacerbated with uh, higher domestic prices and increasing productions and then this uh, has discouraged investment in developing countries. So with regards to this um, and with a more liberal view of European Commission, compliance with WTO and commitment with the policy coherence 
development, which put food security in a high priority. Uh, the current, the latest uh, cap reform of 2014 to 2020 has abolished export subsidies mm -hmm. and reduced market distorting measures, which makes it more market oriented and competition oriented. So this transition into a greater um, EU trade openness regime has many implications on developing countries. And I will talk about this in terms of economic aspects, environmental aspects and social aspects. So for environmental, uh, for economic aspects, as we said before, the uh, ending of export subsidies subsidi has lead to higher commodity price in international market and this can increase the competitiveness of net producers in developing market. However, it can be harmful for consumers in these countries. So we cannot say in general how this transition into a more openness market effect on developing countries because it is case by case situation in terms of if they're net importers or producers in terms of short term and long term. And also um, an openness market also involved the preference erosions as European um, Union has long been giving preferential trade agreements with uh, Africa or Caribbean or Pacific countries and this openness has led to their already has advantage being erupted by newcomers for example Brazil um, Argentina China's which can take more advantage from this trade openness well they having less advantage and also um, uh, as people say that openness to trade has facilitated uh, has been benefiting developing countries this might not be always the case as we have to also consider non-tariff barriers and uh, inadequate market infrastructures. For example, EU has many barriers or uh, regulations regarding sanitary measures or cyber sanitary measures or there's technical barriers to trade and private standards and certification which can lead to price increase in some African countries. And also there is a poor price transmission between international and the domestic markets which um, developing countries might not be able to adjust so well. Also that, um, of course, they lack competition in transport and processing sectors and they receive limited support to their development of supply chains which can serve as barriers to benefiting from what has been promised to them. So in terms of environmental aspects, uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions about CAP's um, detrimental uh, effects on environmental development. So for example, livestock intensification, as the professor has said, has increased uh, demand for protein-rich products and increased import of soybean in South America, and this has a lot of uh, environmental and social aspects negatively. And also, um, and the, a solution to this is that the current cap has promoted grain legume productions and this can reduce its dependency on soybean imports. And also uh, what has to what needs to be pay attention is the growing energy market, especially EU's current bioenergy policies and this has been associated with land grabbing or concentration of lands in a lot of African or other developing countries. And with regards to biodiversity, the recent cap, the abolishment of cap subsidies or reducing budgets has leads, have positive effects on uh, European biodiversity since it reduced intensification in agriculture. But these effects, as it is not globalized, it cannot, it might be having um, in terms negative effects on developing countries as they, it changes the tra trade patterns and then um, they have more intensified uh, agricultural productions. And in terms of climate change, which is very much discussed as agriculture is directly infected by climate change and it also produced or, or um, involved in, re uh, how do you say, affecting climate change. So, uh, but 
at, according to European Union, they say trade openness may, may allow countries to secure food supplies when facing climate risks. And they say that reducing distorting support creates additional incentives for farmers to look for more resilient agricultural systems as they subsidize farms with more greening procedures. However, what are the actual caps effects on environmental quality of developing countries is still under debate and discussions. And for the last discussed um, social aspects of CAP's uh, impacts, uh, with regards to job creation, as we talked about dumping and export um, subsidies, it has a detrimental effects on developing countries. For example, importing of frozen chicken from Spain, Belgium, and France has led to more than 100,000 people out of job in Cameroon. And so it is said that with CAP having more liberal view, more um, less distorting market approach, it can support the improve of development of global value change. However, it also suggests to other barriers we mentioned before. And it also has some uh, relation with migration pressures, as one study says that EU border protecting, limiting uh, export earnings potentials for some developing countries has contributed to migration pressures uh, across the borders. And also it is studied that uh, Agricultural policies has an urban bias as higher food price has induced a shift in location of poverty effects and leading in terms to change in development policies we need to pay attention to constantly. So having in mind of these economical, um, environmental and social aspects, Francie we will now talk about the new proposal of CAP for the years. Okay, so as you might know, next year there will be a new cup decided for the year to, uh, 2021 to 2027. Um, what is going to change is a decreasing budget, so the budget is, is going to drop again. Um, and especially for the second pillar, which is uh, the rural development, you see it here on the left-hand side. Um, the, in the rural development, uh, that's very important for small-scale farmers, obviously, which is directly related to jobs, but also um, a better environmental situation. That's why I find it a little bit um, yeah, strange that exactly in this pillar they're um, cutting down budget, um, while on the other pillar, which is the market support pil uh, pillar, the budget is remaining more or less the same. I mean, it's also going down, but not as much. Yeah, uh, the European Commission already made some proposals for this new cup and uh, some of their proposals are to enhance the ambition on environment and climate, to simplify and modernize the policy, to encourage innovation, to respond to social concerns about the quality uh, of their food and production methods, uh, to en encourage greater jobs, um, job growth, uh, especially in rural areas, and to review and rebalance the responsibilities between the EU and the member states. Um, also to shift the focus of the payments and support uh, away from compliance uh, with the EU rules towards the focus more on performance, so higher production. And they also want to modernize the sector by fostering and sharing knowledge, innovation and digitalization in agriculture and rural areas. Yeah, which is all these nice things are related to Pillar 2. But um, I asked myself how they want to do it with a lower budget. That was everything from our side. Uh, now we will move on to the questions. So um, I will just going to read them and then uh, you can answer to them. So uh, first question, we are witnessing an increasing market concentration. If we look at uh, ever larging, larger growing every food businesses like Nestle, Monsanto, Bayer, uh, BASF, etc. Uh, while the most sustainable and maybe also most productive ones in terms of uh, food pr uh, produced per hectare long term are the small scale farmers. So that's why my question is how can we make the U term turn uh, for sake of the farmer's livelihood, uh, the environment, biodiversity and finally also food security. Second question uh, regarding the recent policy uh, developments, um, for example, increasing soy import from the US in an attempt to mitigate the trade war, Macron's push for liberalization, budget cuts, uh, free trade agreements, 
Are we heading towards a weaker or even the end of a cup? The cup. Um, and what would be the impact to farmers? Uh, then the third question is, what do you propose as an alternative direction for the global agricultural uh, and food regime that could satisfy producers, consumers uh, in both developed and developing countries while protecting the environment? And the last question, uh, while major developed countries have shifted towards more market-oriented approaches on agricultural policies, trade distorting measures in emerging and developing countries seem to rise. What will be the effect on the global market? Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. So I, I'm you going to try it. Yeah, sure. Um. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation, which, which was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to react on your presentation and uh, to answer to this question quite... Uh, I have five minutes? No. They, they you have one hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you need... Yeah, one hour with everything. Okay, yeah. that's all. Uh, you need to open the floor. <laughs> yeah, I need to open the floor. We need to, you need to open the floor. Uh, I'm, uh, so f uh, I, I'm going to react to your uh, critique about the, the amount of the budget for the common agriculture policy. You say, okay, there are only 3% of uh, farmers in Europe. Uh, also, 3% of workers are in the agriculture sector. And we are expanded... Expen uh, we are um, expanding 30% um, of uh, the European budget for that. Just have in mind that the European budget is very low, anyway, as regards the national budget. The European budget is only, I think, something like 150 billion <laughs> per year, okay? I don't know if you, you know, for example, the public expenses uh, of France? So, of the states, of the French states, and all the public authorities in France. Yeah? Yeah, 1,000 1, billion, something like this, roughly. Yeah, roughly. And uh, yeah, and two, two hundred, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so you know, here are the public expenses from the French state and the French authorities, and the public budget of the European Union. So, thirty percent of the European Union is not so much. So that's it. So, and finally, it depends on what we look, uh, what we regard. Because uh, if you, for example, uh, more than 50% of, uh, of the space of the France is occupied by agriculture. And this is the same in all European countries, more or less. So, you know, the, the, the stakes, the challenges of the agriculture is very big if you regard the environmental issues, uh, the, you know, the... Uh, all the planning of the territory and so on. So finally, we could consider that 50 billion per year is not so much as regards all the stakes of the agricultural and the uh, food sector. Finally, the food security is really uh, a basic need and uh, a basic geostrategic uh, objective. So, first of all, but you are right, uh, 50 billion, uh, this is quite an amount. And we have to uh, think about uh, the, the impacts of this policy. About the export subsidies, um, I said that at the beginning, the cap, so uh, since the 60s until 2015, the cap was composed, uh, was compound, compound? composed of agricultural uh, export subsidies, okay? And it was 
moved out, out in 2015, okay, because of a WTO engagement in Europe, and same for uh, all the rich countries. In fact, um, we could say that it's a, it's a progress because the export subsidies has very negative had very negative impacts on the little farms on the the agricultural development in the south country especially because why because we exported products at very low prices you know thanks to the export subsidies and it was uh, you know an unfair uh, uh, competition with uh, the farmers in the South countries which do not benefit from this kind of subsidies, okay? But, now I want to, uh, to have a but. <laughs> um, but uh, the problem is now these 50 billion of subsidies, direct subsidies, because it allows to export to very low prices now also. Uh, anyway, uh, most of the farmers in Europe couldn't export at these very low prices without these direct subsidies, okay? So I don't know if there is uh, really a progress. Anyway, you know that Trump, the, the last year, the last summer, he considered that uh, these subsidies were a distortion of competition. And he attacked uh, the, 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 the subsidies for the olive, olive, yeah, olive, it's fine for you? Olive. Olive, olive, olives, olives production because uh, of the subsidies, subsidi uh, subsidies given to European farmers, especially the Spanish farmers. And he attacked us and he said, okay, I'm going to make the, tra the, the duties very higher in USA on your export of olives because you use uh, direct subsidies in Europe. And the problem is that all the subsidies to all agricultural products are like the subsidies to alive products. So, uh, we, are going, we are going to wait for the answer of the WTO, but if the WTO considers that the Olive subsidies are a distortion, we can stop the scap anyway. <laughs> or if we can trink and say, uh, this is a distortion, I, uh, I make my uh, duties uh, higher. So it's just for showing you that the direct subsidies is really not an answer today according to other countries in the world. Anyway, um, yeah, but I would say that for export subsidies, as for um, uh, direct subsidies, <coughs> on my mind, it depends on the source country or the poor country and its policy. Because you say export subsidy can be also a help if you manage to protect your country uh, in, a, in a smart way, uh, so for example, you accept some imports with very, uh, very low price for your consumer, but you, you manage to protect your farmers uh, for some other products and so on, it can be smart and it can be uh, indirect subsidies for your consumers anyway. You understand that? And that's why that was, for example, the policy of, the, of Egypt during a long time. Uh, so they had big uh, trade uh, tariffs on some products and not on, uh, on others. And uh, so it was good for the consumers, it was good for a part of the farmers and so. On my mind, and I'm going to speak about the developing countries, I would say the poor countries anyway, but because many countries are not going to be developed, and that's a pity, but that's, I think it's less hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite to speak about poor countries anyway. Uh, I think the problem is not really our cap, but it's a point of view. 
The problem is that we oblige these countries not to protect themselves. For example, the European Union is going to make sign all the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries uh, a, a free trade agreement which oblige them to open their barrier to all agricultural products. That's the problem. The problem is that we, we oblige them to deregulate them, their markets and to lower their trade bar uh, ta uh, tariffs. This is the same for India. The India had a very strong fight in the, in the, uh, in the WTO because they didn't want to, um, um, to destroy their policy, their storage policy, uh, a policy of um, food security which uh, have a big intervention on prices, on storage and so on. WTO demanded, and especially United States and Europe, demanded to India to destroy that. India refused, and there was a compromise. Now there is a temporary compromise. But you, you can see the, the pressure of Europe, of United States, and so on, to make disappear uh, the protection of those countries, especially because we, the, the or um, our uh, transnational enterprises have a big interest on that. And that's the problem, is that th this is that we, we try to make disappear the protection of these countries. So on my mind, the problem is not the cap. The, the, problem is the cap is a problem for the liberal, in the liberal view, that's all. For the most liberal guys, we, mu we, we should make disappear totally the cap. But also, we, we, we should make disappear totally the protection of each country. But there is another uh, point of view, which is we must have protection in every country. And I, I'm, I'm going to finish with that. Not in a competition way, uh, I protect myself, you protect yourself also, and so on. We, we should, on my mind, think about a new multilateral regulation. And that's the problem also, is that we, you, you said that we are going from a multilateral uh, framework, negotiations, to bilateral negotiations. And on my mind, this is really much more in favor of the rich, of the richest countries. Why? Because in the WTO, it's clear that it's based on the uh, liberal view and uh, on the very strong agreement for deregulated markets, that's clear. But uh, since I, I, sh I, I sh should say 20 <coughs> uh, for 20 years, there is really much more coalitions between those countries and especially on the, uh, in the agricultural sector because they don't want to make disappear their, their markets, their, uh, their regulation. Especially India is very strong for that, but uh, there is also China and so on. So many countries don't want to, to make it disappear. And they also criticized the North country, which subsidized with direct subsidies their farmers, saying, oh no, there is no distortion. This is direct subsidies which do not create distortions, which is false. And you, you have to make disappear our protection. And those countries began to say no. And what happened? There was a blockage, there was uh, uh, problems into the WTO because of that especially, and because the South country didn't want anymore to accept this liberal, uh, this liberal uh, negotiations uh, in favor of the North country. And what happened? The WTO is, uh, is now really, really weakened. There is no agreement, bilateral agreement, since 94. And in the same time, bilateral agreement uh, began to develop and develop and develop. And they come much more, um, uh, they, they are much more, uh, they are str really stronger in terms of liberalization than the WTO agreement. It goes further. And the problem is that the, 
the balance of power is much more in favor of the North countries in this case, because you are directly in a bilateral uh, balance of power, you know, without the possibility of coalitions between South countries, poor countries, and so on. And on my mind, it's clear that WTO should be uh, reformed, uh, profoundly uh, uh, transformed, and so on. But the bilateral agreements are worst, really worst. And the, the, uh, so the, the, the example, the big example, is the free, free trade agreement between European Union and uh, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, which obliged which really uh, make worst, uh, which obliged to make disappear the protection in the source country. So that's why, on my mind, this, this is a problem with, uh, the de for the, de the developing countries. And one other problem is that we, are, uh, we, we decreased our subsidies for develop the, public, uh, the development public aid to the, to the poor countries, anyway. And finally, we made disappear in the 80s, 90s, also the international agreements on some products which allow to stabilize market, especially for the tropical products. Because before we had international agreements until the 80s on the coffee, on the uh, cacao and so on. We had also special agreement with the Caribbean and African countries uh, in favor of them and so on. This was really a, politic of cooperation, a policy of cooperation with these South countries. Okay, this was not... Uh, it, it had also limits, but the, the we tried to make it because there was a geopolitical situation which allowed it. We, we, we wanted to make a block against the Russian and so on, but we had a policy of cooperation. Now all of this disappeared and there is no more uh, international regulation of market as it was the case. And it was replaced uh, by the WTO in a very liberal view and now it's worse, it's replaced by bilateral agreement, you know. So on my mind, this is really the problem. So and, and the cap is, a, is now a problem because there is no more protection in the source countries, that's all. And no more international regulation and less and less public aid development and so on. Uh, finally, um, yeah, what could we do in cap for the European farmers and the little farm farmers? We, as, for example, we could decide to, um, so this is a proposal of the Via Campesina Confederation Paysanne since uh, uh, 80, I think. Um, we could decide to subsidize each farmer uh, with a, a maximum amount. Each farmer and not each hectare. So that you help each farm, each farmer, and not each hectare. So you subsidize the, the jobs, the work, and not uh, the, the capital, to be clear. Okay? So maybe Fine. We, we open the floor for anyone who has questions? Because we have 15 minutes now. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and don't forget uh, uh, to introduce yourself in terms of where you come from. So we will take three questions. Especially for this kind of issues, you know. Uh, yes. So we take three questions. Monty and Martin and... Uh, Thank you. You want to cheer? Mm -hmm. Ah, we... Uh, nice Voilà. <laughs> Okay, so Mohib. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Mohib. I'm from India and yeah. I'm part of the macroeconomics track. Uh, so my question is basically how, to what extent is the common agricultural policy committed to the Doha round and the GATT agreements at the Doha round? Because mm -hmm. since what you were saying that there is a 
shift and there is a concerted shift towards liberalizing the trade market, especially in agricultural commodities. And there's a shift towards export competitiveness in agricultural commodities. Whereas, you know, the Doha development round was about organizing least developed countries together. So the first question is how, to what extent is CAP committed to the Doha round? Because as far as I understand, Europe and USA have been consistently blocking attempts towards the safety SSM mechanism and the public stock holding that you referenced. So they've been consistently blocking the do I mean the principles in the Doha round. Yeah. And I'm saying that we need to move towards a new agreement. Yeah. So th that's the first question. I mean, how much do you see CAP aligned with the principles of the Doha round? And the second question is, I mean, what are these big multinational companies in Europe that you are referring to who want this export liberalization to happen? Are these basically in export of agricultural products or are these companies, for instance, companies that manufacture fertilizers or seeds mm -hmm. or, you know, who are exporting technology. Right. So who are these big multinational companies in Europe who want this export okay. liberalization to happen? Okay, thanks you very much for your presentation. I'm Martin, I come from Belgium and I'm studying in option C, which is the development policies option. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is very easy. The second one is more tricky. Um, so first, I'd like to know if you have an idea uh, what the, the agri-food trade surpluses uh, of the EU represent in the total um, trade balance of the EU. Um, and then the second question, I need to make two points. So it relates to how do we get to a sustainable agricultural uh, production system. Um, so if we want to push uh, small-scale uh, agroecological farming and that kind of stuff, uh, this means that actually these uh, production models will um, use much less machinery, much less entrance, much less energy, but much more labor. So basically, um, this will push uh, unit costs pretty much compared to what the big farms are doing, which is using a lot of entrance and machinery, m much yeah. less labor, and having very low unit cost in order to uh, enjoy economies of scale. Uh, so that's one point. How do we m make those new um, models competitive with those ones? It's, it looks really bad. And second would be a more macroeconomic, like structural argument, and it's based on what Marx already said about the, the functioning of agriculture in a capitalist system, which is that basically if you want to have um, a large part of the population working in the service sector, in the manufacturing sectors in cities, uh, the fact that you, that you have a, a very low portion of the population employed in the agricultural, agricultural, ag agricultural sector with a very productivist model and low prices in order to yeah. make a living possible for the, the workers, the reserve army in, in the city centers. Um, how do we maintain the whole functioning of a capitalist system with this new type of agricultural model in the rural, uh, in the countryside? So my question, the second question, which is much trickier, is basically even if we have more regulated market, uh, better policies, do you think it is possible to have a sustainable agricultural system within the framework of uh, a capitalist system? Yeah, this is a <laughs> very, very interesting question. Uh, hello, my name is Matheus from Option B, Macroeconomics also. Uh, I'm from Brazil. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation, especially the part highlighting the hypocrisy of the term developing. And uh, two very quick questions. Uh, the first, you mentioned one agreement with U.S. regarding soya in the 60s. Why only soya? I, I was, and the other, uh, you mentioned many times the agreements with uh, African and Caribbean countries. And I would like, uh, if you consider that the agreement between Mercosur and the European Union, if it's really put in place, finish it, would be the same case, as if you said. It will be worse for us, but anyway. 
<laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to begin with a uh, question on soya, Mercosur, and so on. No, I, I spoke about soya because it was an example anyway. If we speak about Latin America, we could say that there is also bigger and bigger export of uh, meat, for example, uh, cow meat. And uh, anyway, uh, you know that Brazil, for example, is a, a net exporter and export more and more towards the EU, but only not only the EU, China, and so on, anyway. And there is, a, if, uh, I said that uh, European Union have, thousands, uh, have hundreds of free trade agreements already signed or being negotiated, okay? And one of the big trade agreements now, which is being negotiated, is uh, uh, the agreement of, of the Mercosur with Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina, yes. And this is a very big subject for the agricultural field because uh, the Brazil is very, very competitive thanks to a little part of its farms which are the agro-business farms, uh, which are uh, capitalist farms uh, for the most of part, or uh, patronal, patronal, yes, is that fine? Um, boss, boss, yeah, with boss and salaries, big farm with boss and salaries. This is a very little part of the farm is Brazil, but it occupies the, the most of the, of the agricultural area. And this agro-business is very competitive because it has very low cost of, um, um, of earth. Uh, le coût du foncier. Land. Land, land. Uh, yeah, sure, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. So the cost of land is very low uh, thanks to uh, the deforestation and so on. So they big. Yeah. Because yeah. they never pay for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and the process of colonization and so on. So uh, the cost of land is very low. The cost of salaries is uh, very low. And the cost of, uh, for example, sewerhouse for feeding animals is very low, thanks to the big uh, monoculture of soya, of sewerhouse, and so on. They are very big, you know, for example, in Brazil or in other parts of Latin America and United States or Canada, the you have very big uh, plots, uh, units, for um, feeding animals, just for feeding animals with tens of thousands of animals in each unit. So it is very, very uh, far from our model. In France or in Europe, the most of the units for feeding animals are familial farms, with perhaps uh, 50 in France 50, 100 animals. And we are competing with uh, agro-business with uh, tens of thousands of animals in Canada, in the United States, in Latin America. But I just want to say that this is a very little part of the farms in Brazil. And I would just wa li li would like to say that now your president, uh, Bolsonaro, and Temer, uh, the one in 2017, he has destroyed all the policies which were developed by Lula and by um, Dilma, Dilma, Dilma. Dilma uh, in favor of the familial farms. It has all destroyed in, sev in two years. And now there is a really much more stronger um, policy in favor of the agro-business, which means that you have a big new compromise between the neoliberal and the, the extreme right forces in Brazil. It is not new because in Ch Chile, for Chile, for example, in the 70s you had that, but anyway, here Bolsonaro is clearly, when you regard the, the agricultural sector, is really some, someone who ha has made the combination between the fascist or the extreme right and uh, the liberal and transnational interests. This is really, really clear. Anyway, it's not very optimistic, <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I want you to speak with that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Not sure. Uh, Ju the question on the um, trade balance. The agricultural products, I don't know, I, I, don't, uh, I, I didn't uh, regard it. 
for all the Europe because it's really it's very very different different according to each country. But for example, for the Canada, I made the calculation: uh, ten percent of uh, the trade is. Uh, is uh, composed of agricultural products, for example. So when we speak about the free trade agreement with Canada, agricultural products are very concerned because it's 10% of the trade with Canada. So, but I don't have for all Europe and for all, tr all, all trade. Uh, but very important what you said about the, develop the development of the agriculture and the capitalist system. Uh, few minutes about that. Um, I, I would need two hours, but anyway, I'm going to make it very um, quickly. You have a diff... Uh, I'm going to try to explain you how we imagined the development of agriculture in the 50s or 60s. That's it. We have to, product, to produce more and more thanks to the... the the increase of the productivity of work. So each, uh, each farmer can produce more and more in terms of quantity, in terms of quantity, that's it. Productivity of the land, you know, and thanks to that, much more input, okay? And what was important it was, it was to increase the production, the volume of production. We can have another, um, another uh, kind of model. Est-ce que je peux remonter ça? Yeah, c'est là. Fine. We can have another model, which I name, uh, I don't, or other organizations of development name, the, the autonomous and economic development, or what we could say the agroecology, the real agroecology. What is, what is it? The real agroecology, the real agroecology, as it was imagined by its founder, Altieri, and so on. So, uh, what, what is it? This is that we need to increase the net added value, and for that. What ha do we have to do? We have to be more autonomous to increase the price. And for that, you have to, um, uh, make, uh, to make, for example, the, the value chains, the full value chains uh, more little or to decrease the, the, the number of intermediary, OK? And you could also use signs of quality, organic farming and so on, okay? So you increase the price, but before all, you decrease the intermediary consumptions, okay? And the uh, fixed capital, or the capital in machines, the capital in, uh, I don't know, all of, and for that, so um, you have to replace intermediary consumption, capital, and so on by work, by labor force. Okay, because and it could be um, it could be also in favor of the ecology, as you can have. Uh, um, you can have uh, positive in connections with the ecology. Uh, with the ecology, I would say that for organic farming, for example, if you want to make organic farming with lower uh, inputs, okay, you really need to work more with uh, the the ecosystems, okay. And for that, you need more training. You need more jobs, more labor force because you need less machines also. And this could be, this could increase the added value. And we have now a lot of examples in France of farms which decreased their inputs, which increased the rate of, of uh, jobs in the farms. 
and which decreased really the negative impacts on environment. For example, they increased the, the grassland, they diversified the crop rotations, and so on. And so for that, you need also a big uh, service sector, which is a sector of uh, uh, for accompanying the, the farmers, you know, not for selling them products and so on, but for uh, bringing them knowledge, you know. That's why it can be also uh, positive for uh, the, sec the service sector, but not in the same way of uh, I want to sell you uh, that fertilizer or I want to sell you, you know. Yeah, I agree 100% that this is what we should do. But then I really wonder how is this, um, how we can we generalize that in the presence of um, uh, a competing model that keep doing completely sure. otherwise, that is pushing so down the, and yeah. We, it it yeah. can only remain very marginal, you know, like a sub-market of organic products and like. Sure, but that it means that we have, for example, in France, that we have a very, uh, I, I'm being uh, honest with you, very uh, uh, a, a government which is clearly anti-liberal. I don't know if we, you have to, to reject totally the capitalist system. Anyway, you have to be very anti-liberal to uh, make pressure on the uh, trade, uh, on the um, transnational enterprises. For example, it means to protect ourselves, to have, re re to, to re restore uh, all measures. Uh, for example, we, we should um, reject all imports with um, polluant uh, uh, products, uh, with, uh, you know, and for example, with GMOs and so on. That's clearly uh, a way to uh, di disobedience of disobedience with the European Union, and on my mind, we, we on my mind we cannot do this without disobeying disobeying Dis disobeying to the European Union and its rules. That's clear. It means to refuse all free trade agreements. Uh, it means uh, to uh, sustain very differently our agriculture. Because today, uh, we, I, I had a, a PhD te thesis which shows that uh, in average uh, there is a link between the amount of subsidies and the pollution of farms. So more you pollute and more you receive subsidies per hectare, for example. So it means to change everything in the distribution of subsidies and to have subsidies per job and really with big environmental co co cross compliance to regulate against your markets. For example, to develop uh, the short supply chains, for example, in the collective restoration, you know, that means also to break the rules of the European Union for favoring the regional producers. That, that's so on my mind, you, you cannot do this inside the European rules now, that's clear. That's why what we demand uh, in the platform of big NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs, uh, um, solidarity NGOs and, and so on in France, it's clearly not uh, possible without ch changing Europe and, uh, and the liberal uh, compromise of the Europe. So I don't know if it's the capitalist system anyway, uh, <laughs> it means to reject uh, the, the liberal view. That's clear. Is, is it affordable for The microphone, please. S sorry, sorry, Moe. This is really related. Like, is, is this possible to have that system which is affordable to everyone? When, like, that's, that's my biggest problem because this already exists, but it's kind that's of targeted towards yeah. a relat. Sorry, my name is Nils, <laughs> and I'm French, and I come from the development yeah, option. Uh, is it possible? Um, I don't know if we can have all the farming in organic farming, I don't know, yeah. but it's clear, it's clear that we can go towards all of that. This is the decreasing of inputs. You know, for example, our first sector of imports is the energy. Mm -hmm. If we decrease our uh, use of fossil energy, we will decrease our imports of energy. 
So it's false when the liberal guys say, oh no, it's impossible because of the trade balance. Because anyway, we will have a, a new balance. So I think it's possible for each farm in one condition is to break with the liberal rules and on my mind to have uh, a state with uh, uh, a very big administration uh, and uh, association and so on which accompany the farmers to make it. Like we made in the 60s in France or in Germany and so on. We, had, we, we wanted to make, the make grow the production, it was a stake. Now the stake is to answer to the ecological and social needs and for that we need really a new administration with a new, you know, well, okay. I, I agree on the macro perspective, but can you make that affordable for people? Like, I mean, uh, is it possible to do that without having the share of, ag like, consumption, of, like, food consumption in the budget of, like, a worker's family, not going yeah. back to, like, 50% of the budget that's instead of what it is That's today. why, for, on my mind, a first lever w would be the collective restoration, okay. the collective cooking. So in the schools, uh, in the administration, and so on. Which means, and it is already the case, but in, in not in many uh, not in many tons, but some ca some tons made it, and they don't have a, a higher price than the others. So it's possible, it's possible, but we must have a, a strong uh, policy at the national level, and not according to each or each state, um, each city. And it's difficult, even in my, in my city, which is communist, uh, with a communist uh, mayor and uh, it's private, uh, it's uh, awful, it's expensive, it's uh, a very big uh, transnational enterprise which uh, feed uh, the, the, the children and so on. So it's difficult, it's n I know, but many towns made it and, and the United States, for example, have a very interesting policy in favor of that because they know that they can favor the regional producers thanks to that and to change pro progressively the consumption in the school. So. Just